Images and Symbols by Mircha Iliadi Forward, the rediscovery of symbolism. The surprising popularity of psychoanalysis has made the fortunes of certain key words. Image, symbol, and symbolism have now become current coin. At the same time, systematic research devoted to the mechanisms of primitive mentality has revealed the importance of symbolism in archaic thinking and also the fundamental part it plays in the life of any and every primitive society. The obsolescence of scientism in philosophy, the revival of interest in religion since the First World War, many poetic developments and, above all, the researches of surrealism with the rediscovery of occultism, of the black literature, of the absurd, etc., have on various levels, and with unequal effects, drawn the attention of the public in general to the symbol regarded as an autonomous mode of cognition. The development in question is a part of the reaction against the 19th century's rationalism, positivism, and scientism, which became such a marked characteristic of the second quarter of the 20th. But this conversion to the various symbolisms is not really a discovery to be credited to the modern world. In restoring the symbol to its status as an instrument of knowledge, our world is only returning to a point of view that was general in Europe until the 18th century and is, moreover, co-natural to the other non-European cultures, whether historic, like those of Asia or Central America, for instance, or archaic and primitive. It is noteworthy that the invasion of Western Europe by symbolism coincides with the arrival of Asia on the horizon of history, an advent which, initiated by the revolution of Sun Yat-sen, has been unmistakably affirmed during the last few years. Meanwhile, ethnic groups which, until now, had no place in world history except for glimpses and passing allusions, such as the Oceans, Africans, and others, are preparing in their turn to enter into the great currents of contemporary history and already impatient to do so. Not that there is any causal connection whatever between the rising of the exotic or archaic world above the horizon of history and the return to favor in Europe of symbolic knowledge. But the fact is that this synchronism is particularly fortunate. One may well ask how else the positivistic and materialistic Europe of the 19th century would be able to maintain a spiritual conversation with exotic cultures all of which, without exception, are devoted to ways of thought that are alien to empiricism or positivism. This gives us at least some grounds for hope that Europe will not remain paralyzed before the images and symbols which, in that exotic world, either take the place of our concepts or take them up and extend them. It is a striking fact that, of all our modern European spirituality, two things alone really interest the non-European worlds, Christianity and Communism. Both of these, in different ways, and upon clearly opposed grounds, are soteriologies, doctrines of salvation, and therefore deal in symbols and myths upon a scale without parallel except among non-European humanity. A fortunate conjunction in time, as we said, has enabled Western Europe to rediscover the cognitive value of the symbol at the moment when Europeans are no longer the only peoples to, quote, make history and when European culture, unless it shuts itself off into a sterilizing provincialism, will be obliged to reckon with other ways of knowing and other scales of value than its own. In this respect, all the discoveries and successive fashions concerned with the irrational, with the unconscious, with symbolisms, poetic experience, exotic and non-representational art, etc., have been indirectly of service to the West as preparations for a more living and therefore a deeper understanding of non-European values, and in particular for a dialogue with the non-European peoples. One is only to reflect upon the attitude that 19th century ethnography took up towards its subject, and above all to consider the results of its researches to measure the progress made by ethnography during the last 30 years. The ethnologist of today has not only grasped the importance of symbolism in archaic thinking, but has seen its intrinsic coherence, its validity, its speculative audacity, its, quote, nobility. Better still, today we are well on the way to an understanding of one thing of which the 19th century had not even a presentiment, that the symbol, the myth, and the image are of the very substance of the spiritual life, that they may become disguised, mutilated, or degraded, but are never extirpated. It would be well worthwhile to study the survival of the great myths throughout the 19th century, 
one would then see how they were humbled, minimized, condemned to incessant change of form, and yet survived that hibernation, thanks chiefly to literature. Thus it is that the myth of the earthly paradise has survived until today, in adapted form as an Oceanian paradise. For the last 150 years, all the great European literatures have vied with each other in exalting the paradisiatic islands of the Pacific Ocean, havens of all happiness, although the reality was very different. Quote, flat and monotonous landscapes, unhealthy climates, ugly and obese women, etc. But the image of this ocean in paradise remained proof against geographical or any other realities. What had objective realities to do with the ocean in paradise? This was something of a theological order. It had received, assimilated, and readapted all the paradisaic images repressed by positivism and scientism. The earthly paradise still believed in by Christopher Columbus, did he not fancy he had discovered it, turned into a South Sea island in the 19th century. But its function in the economy of the human psyche remained the same. Over there, in the island, in that paradise, existence unfolded itself outside time and history. Man was happy, free, and unconditioned. He did not have to work for his living. The women were young, eternally beautiful, and no law hung heavily over their loves. Even nudity in that distant isle recovered its metaphysical meaning, that of perfect humanity, of Adam before the fall. Geographical reality might give the lie to that paradisaic landscape. Ugly and corpulent women might confront the traveler's eyes, but these they did not see. Each one saw only the image he had brought with him. Symbolism and Psychoanalysis Symbolic thinking is not the exclusive privilege of the child, of the poet, or of the unbalanced mind. It is consubstantial with human existence. It comes before language and discursive reason. The symbol reveals certain aspects of reality, the deepest aspects, which defy any other means of knowledge. Images, symbols, and myths are not irresponsible creations of the psyche. They respond to a need and fulfill a function that of bringing to light the most hidden modalities of being. Consequently, the study of them enables us to reach a better understanding of man, of man as he is, before he has come to terms with the conditions of history. Every historical man carries on, within himself, a great deal of prehistoric humanity. That, indeed, is a point that was never quite forgotten, even in the most inclement days of positivism. For who knows better than a positivist that man is an animal, defined and ruled by the same instincts as his brothers, the animals. That correct but incomplete description served as an exclusive frame of reference, but today we are beginning to see that the non-historical portion of every human being does not simply merge into the animal kingdom, as in the 19th century so many thought it did, nor ultimately into, quote, life, but that, on the contrary, it bifurcates and rises right above life. This non-historical part of the human being wears, like a metal, the imprinted memory of a richer, a more complete, and almost beatific existence. When a historically conditioned being, for instance an Occidental of our own days, allows himself to be invaded by the non-historical part of himself, which happens to him much oftener and more completely than he imagines, this is not necessarily a retrogression towards the animal stage of humanity or a redescent towards the deepest sources of organic life. Often he is re-entering, by means of the images and symbols that then come into play, a paradisaic stage of primordial humanity, whatever its concrete existence may then have been. For this primordial man is admittedly an archetype, never fully realizable in any human existence at all. In escaping from his historicity, man does not abdicate his status as a human being or abandon himself to animality. He recovers the language and sometimes the experience of a lost paradise. Dreams, waking dreams, the images of his nostalgias and of his enthusiasms, etc., are so many forces that they may project the historically conditioned human being into a spiritual world that is infinitely richer than the closed world of his own historic moment. According to the Surrealists, any man might become a poet. He need only know how to give himself up to automatic writing. Their poetic technique is fully justifiable from sound psychological doctrine. The unconscious, as it is called, is far more poetic, and let us add more philosophic, more mythic, 
than the conscious. It is not always necessary to know mythology in order to live out the great mythical themes. This is well known to psychologists who discover the most beautiful mythologies in the waking dreams of their patients. For the unconscious is not haunted by monsters only. The gods, the goddesses, the heroes, and the fairies dwell there too. Moreover, the monsters of the unconscious are themselves mythological, seeing that they continue to fulfill the same functions that they fulfilled in all the mythologies. In the last analysis, that of helping man to liberate himself, to complete his initiation. The brutal language of Freud and his orthodox disciples has often irritated beyond Penzant's readers. In fact, however, that brutality of language arises from a misunderstanding. It is not the sexuality in itself that is annoying. It is the ideology that Freud built upon his, quote, pure sexuality. Fascinated by his mission, he believed himself to be the first awakened one, where he was only the last of the positivists. Freud could not bring himself to see that sexuality never has been pure, that everywhere and always it is a polyvalent function whose primary and perhaps supreme valency is the cosmological function, so that to translate a psychic situation into sexual terms is by no means to belittle it. For, except in the modern world, sexuality has everywhere and always been a hierophany and the sexual act an integral action, therefore also a means to knowledge. The attraction that the male infant feels towards its mother and its corollary, the Oedipus complex, are only shocking insofar as they are analyzed as such, instead of being presented as they should be, as so much imagery. For it is the image of the mother that is really in question, and not this or that mother here and now, as Freud gives one to understand. It is the image of the mother which reveals, and which alone can reveal, her reality and her functions, at once cosmological, anthropological, and psychological. To translate the images into concrete terms is an operation devoid of meaning. The images comprise, it is true, all those allusions to the concrete that Freud has brought to light, but the reality that they are trying to signify cannot be reduced to such concrete references. The origin of the images also is a problem that is beside the point. It is as though one were to dispute the truth of mathematics on the pretext that the historical discovery of geometry emerged from the great works undertaken by the ancient Egyptians for the canalization of the delta. Philosophically, these problems of the origin and of the true interpretation of the images are pointless. We need only remember that the attraction to the mother, if we interpret it on the plane of the immediate and concrete, like the desire to possess one's own mother, can never tell us anything more than what it says. Whereas if we take account of the fact that what is in question is the image of the mother, this desire means many things at once, for it is the desire to re-enter into the bliss of living matter that is still unformed with all its possible lines of development, cosmological, anthropological, etc. For as we have said, and as the following pages will show, images by their very structure are multivalent. If the mind makes use of images to grasp the ultimate reality of things, it is just because reality manifests itself in contradictory ways, and therefore cannot be expressed in concepts. We know what desperate efforts have been made by various theologies and metaphysics, oriental as well as occidental, to give expression to the coincidentia oppositorum, a mode of being that is readily and almost abundantly conveyed by images and symbols. It is therefore the image as such, as a whole bundle of meanings, that is true, and not any one of its meanings, nor one alone of its many frames of reference, to translate an image into a concrete terminology by restricting it to any one of its frames of reference is to do worse than mutilate it. It is to annihilate it, to annul it as an instrument of cognition. We are not unaware that in certain cases the psyche may fixate an image on one single frame of reference, that of the concrete, but this is already a proof of psychic disequilibrium. No doubt there are cases in which the image of the mother is no more than an incestuous desire for the actual mother, but psychologists are in agreement in seeing such a carnal interpretation of the symbol as a sign of psychic crisis. Upon the actual plane of dialectic of the image, any exclusive reduction is an aberration. The history of religions, too, abounds in unilateral and therefore aberrant interpretations of symbols. 
one could hardly adduce a single great religious symbol whose history is not that of tragic succession of innumerable falls. There is no heresy so monstrous, or orgy so infernal, no religious cruelty, folly, absurdity, or religious magic so insane, that it may not be justified in its very principle by some false, because partial and incomplete, interpretation of a grandiose symbolism. The Survival of Images it is not necessary, however, to appeal to the discoveries of depth psychology or the surrealist techniques of automatic writing in order to prove the subconscious survival in modern man of a mythology that is ever abundant and, in our view, of a spiritual authenticity superior to his conscious living. We do not need to rely on the poets or psychiatry for confirmation of the actuality and power of images and symbols. The most commonplace existence swarms with images. The most realistic man lives by them. Let us repeat, and what follows will richly illustrate this, that symbols never disappear from the reality of the psyche. The aspect of them may change, but their function remains the same. One has only to look behind their latest masks. The most abject nostalgia discloses the nostalgia for paradise. The images of the oceanic paradise that we have mentioned haunt our novels as well as our films. Who was it that said of cinema that it was the factory of dreams? We might just as well analyze the images suddenly released by any sort of music, sometimes by the most sentimental song, and we should find that these images express the nostalgia for a mythicized past transformed into an archetype, and that this past signifies not only regrets for a vanished time, but countless other meanings. It expresses all that might have been, but was not, the sadness of all existence, which is only by ceasing to be something else. Regrets that one does not live in the country or in the times evoked by the song, whatever the local or historical coloring may be, the Russia of the balalaikas, the gorgeous East, the Haiti of the films, the life of the American millionaire, the exotic prince, etc., in short, the longing for something altogether different from the present instant, something in fact inaccessible or irretrievably lost, paradise itself. What is important about these images of the nostalgia for paradise is that they always express more than the subject who has experienced them could convey in words. Moreover, most human beings would be incapable of describing them, not because they are less intelligent than the others, but because they do not attach over much importance to our analytical language. Such images bring men together, however, more effectively and more genuinely than any analytical language. Indeed, if an ultimate solidarity of the whole human race does exist, it can be felt and activated only at the level of images. We do not say of the subconscious, for we have no proof that there may not also be a transconscious. Men have paid too little attention to such nostalgias. They have not cared to recognize them as anything more than insignificant psychic byproducts, or at the most have agreed that they may be of interest in certain inquiries into the forms of psychic evasion. But the nostalgias are sometimes charged with their meanings that concern man's actual situation, and this entitles them to consideration by the philosopher as much as by the theologian. Still, they were not taken seriously they were felt to be frivolous. An image of paradise lost, suddenly evoked by the music of an accordion? What a compromising subject for a study. This was to forget that the life of modern man is swarming with half-forgotten myths, decaying hierophanies, and secularized symbols. The progressive desacralization of modern man has altered the content of his spiritual life without breaking the matrices of his imagination. A quantity of mythological litter still lingers in the ill-controlled zones of the mind. Moreover, the most noble part of modern man's consciousness is less spiritual than the one is usually inclined to think. A brief analysis would discover that this noble or higher sphere of consciousness contained a few bookish reminiscences, a number of prejudices of various kinds, religious, moral, social, aesthetic, etc., some ready-made ideas about the meanings of life, ultimate reality, and so forth. But beware of looking further, for what has become of the myth of the lost paradise, for instance, or the image of the perfect man, the mystery of the woman and of love, etc.? 
All these are to be found, but how desecrated, degraded, and artificialized, among many other things in the semi-conscious flux of the most down-to-earth existence, in its waking dreams, its fits of melancholy, in the free play of images when consciousness is taking time off, in the street, the underground railway, or elsewhere, and in all kinds of distractions and amusements. There it lies hidden, the whole treasury of myths, laicized and modernized. What has happened to the images is what happens, as Freud has shown us, in the case of over-crude allusions to sexual realities. They have changed their form. In order to survive, the images take on familiar shapes. They are of no less interest for all that. These degraded images present to us the only possible point of departure for the spiritual renewal of modern man. It is of the greatest importance, we believe, to rediscover a whole mythology, if not a theology, still concealed in the most ordinary, everyday life of contemporary man. It will depend upon himself whether he can work his way back to the source and rediscover the profound meanings of all these faded images and damaged myths. But let no one object that these relics are of no interest to modern man, that they belong to a, quote, superstitious past, happily liquidated by the 19th century, or that it is all right for poets, children, and the people in the tube to satiate themselves with nostalgias and images, but for goodness sake let serious people go on thinking and, quote, making history. Such a separation between the serious things of life and dreams does not correspond with reality. Modern man is free to despise mythologies and theologies, but that will not prevent his continuing to feed upon decayed myths and degraded images. The most terrible historical crisis of the modern world, the Second World War and all that has followed from it, has effectually demonstrated that the extirpation of myths and symbols is illusory. Even in the most desperate of historical situations, in the trenches of Stalingrad, in both Nazi and Soviet concentration camps, men and women have sung ballads and listened to stories, even giving up a part of their meager rations to obtain them. And these stories were but projections of the myths. These ballads were filled with nostalgias. All that essential and indescribable part of man that is called imagination dwells in the realms of symbolism and still lives upon archaic myths and theologies. It depends, as we said, upon modern man to reawaken the inestimable treasure of images that he bears within him, and to reawaken the images so as to contemplate them in their pristine purity and assimilate their message. Popular wisdom has many a time given expression to the importance of imagination, for the very health of the individual and for the balance and richness of his inner life. In some modern languages, the man who lacks imagination is still pitied as a limited, second-rate, and unhappy being. The psychologists C.G. Jung, among others of the first rank, have shown us how much the dramas of the modern world proceed from a profound disequilibrium of the psyche, individual as well as collective, brought about largely by a progressive sterilization of the imagination. To have imagination is to enjoy a richness of interior life, an uninterrupted and spontaneous flow of images. But spontaneity does not mean arbitrary invention. Etymologically, imagination is related to both imago, a representation or imitation, and imitor, to imitate or reproduce. And for once, etymology is in accord with both psychological realities and spiritual truth. The imagination imitates the exemplary models, the images, reproduces, reactualizes, and repeats them without end. To have imagination is to be able to see the world in its totality, for the power and the mission of the images is to show all that remains refractory to the concept. Hence the disfavor and failure of the man, quote, without imagination. He is cut off from the deeper reality of life and from his own soul. In recalling these principles, we were trying to show that the study of symbolism is not a work of pure and simple erudition, but one that concerns, at least indirectly, the knowledge of man himself. In short, that it has something to say to anyone who is speaking of a new humanism or a new anthropology. Doubtless, such study of the symbolisms will be of real use only when it is carried on in collaboration. Literary aesthetic, psychology, and philosophical anthropology ought to take account of the findings of the history of religions, of ethnology, and folklore. 
It is primarily with the psychologists and literary critics in mind that we have published this book. The historian of religions is in a better position than anyone else to promote the knowledge of symbols, his documents being at once more comprehensive and more coherent than those at the disposal of the psychologist or the literary critic. They are drawn from the various sources of symbolical thinking. It is in the history of religions that we meet the archetypes, of which only approximate variants are dealt with by psychologists and literary critics. The Plan of the Book The first four chapters of this book were written at different times and for different kinds of readers. Chapters 1 and 2 are accompanied by a minimum of notes. The material upon which they are based had already been incorporated either in our own previous works or those of other investigations. Chapters 3 and 4, however, call for a certain number of notes and references. The material that is brought together in them is in itself enough to make them useful monographs, apart from the interpretation that we have proposed. The last chapter, which at the same time serves as a general conclusion, is also presented with a restricted bibliographic apparatus. The subject it deals with was too vast to permit of any exposition that would be both carefully documented and extremely concise. With the exception of the last chapter, the various studies that follow were not composed to constitute a book. Each of them was, however, in the author's mind an answer to one and the same problem, namely that of the structure of religious symbolism. Each chapter presents one symbolism or one family of symbols, although the way in which they are envisaged may vary from one to another. The symbolism of the center, which is studied in the first chapter and extends the results of some other previous studies, is synthetically expounded without regard to the complications of history. The first part of this chapter states, indeed, the problem of the validity of such a comprehensive treatment of the symbol, and briefly indicates the relations between psychology and the history of religions. The second chapter analyzes the symbolism of time and of the going out of time in one and the same cultural area, that of ancient India. The third chapter deals with the symbolism of knots upon two complementary planes, after confining itself chiefly to the Indo-Europeans by using the researches of Georges de Mazel, it endeavors to compare these data with the parallel symbolisms of other archaic cultures. It is in this chapter, above all, that we shall measure the advantages and the limitations both of historical investigation and of morphological analysis, and thus come to a better understanding of the necessity of making successive use of both these complementary methods. The fourth chapter, devoted to a group of associated symbols, moon, water, fertility, etc., constitutes a description of morphological type intended to elucidate the structures. Finally, the last chapter resumes the findings of all these inquiries from different standpoints, with a view to a systematic integration of magico-religious symbolism. The psychologist will be chiefly interested in the first two chapters and the last, the reader who is pressed for time may excuse himself from reading all of the analyses and the references given in chapters 3 and 4. We have not, however, thought fit to suppress these notes. The danger with studies of symbolism is that of precipitate generalization. Laymen are inclined to content themselves with the first documents that come to their notice and to construct audacious general interpretations of the symbolisms. We have been careful to present at least two examples of analysis of the symbols discussed in order to show how subtle and complex these things really are. On the other hand, we wanted to place some fairly full material at the disposal of psychologists and literary critics, and indeed of philosophers, to enable them to use it, if need be, to their own ends. It is not uncommon in the books of psychologists and literary critics to find a documentation that is worse than insufficient, frankly faulty, the books from which they have taken their material are, oftener than not, the products of amateurs without a critical sense, or of isolated theorists. The non-specialists reply, with some reason, that they cannot do the work of ethnologists and historians of religions, that they have neither the means nor the leisure to undertake long-term researches, and that they are obliged to do their best with such general works as come to hand. The misfortune is that, most of the time, the non-specialists fall for the most mediocre of these general works. And even when they have better luck, they sometimes happen to read badly or too hastily. That is why we have resisted the temptation to suppress the bibliographical apparatus, 
Perhaps some non-specialists may feel the need of making personal contact with the mass of works on ethnology and the history of religions, instead of taking their nourishment from the sorry, out-of-date lubrications of dilettanti or theorists who have been chiefly concerned to illustrate their own generalizations. Psychological literature, especially that produced by psychoanalysis, will have familiarized the reader with the prolixity of its expositions of individual, quote, case histories. One volume published in England has 700 pages on the dream mythology of a single individual. The psychologists are in agreement about the indispensability of exposition in extenso of each particular case, and when they resign themselves to its abbreviation, it is almost always with reluctance. Their ideal would be to publish complete dossiers. With much greater reason ought one to take the same course when studying a symbolism. We need to present it in general outline, but also with all its subtleties, variants, and uncertainties. The central and the most arduous problem remains, obviously, that of interpretation. In principle, one can always question the validity of a hermeneutic study. By multiple cross-references between what is clearly established, texts, rituals, and figured monuments, and semi-veiled allusions, we can demonstrate bit by bit what this or that symbol means. But we can also state the problem in another way. Do those who are making use of the symbols take all their theoretical implications into account? When, for instance, in studying the implications of the cosmic tree, we say that the tree is situated at the center of the world, do we mean that all the individuals belonging to societies which know of trees are equally aware of the complete symbolism of the center? But the validity of the symbol considered as a form of knowledge does not depend upon any individual's degree of understanding. Texts and figured monuments provide us with abundant proof that for some, at least, of the individuals of an archaic society, the symbolism of the center was transparent in its totality, the rest of the society remaining content to participate in the symbolism. Moreover, it is not easy to draw the limits of such a participation, for it varies in function with an indefinite number of factors. All we can say is that the actualization of a symbol is not automatic, it occurs in relation to the tensions and vicissitudes of the social life, and finally with the cosmic rhythms. But whatever eclipses or aberrations a symbolism may undergo from the very fact that it is lived, this does not lessen the validity of its hermeneutics. To take an illustration from another order of realities, in order to understand the symbolism of the Divina Commedia, it is necessary to ask what its millions of readers, distributed all over the globe, have made of that difficult book, or should we not rather to ask what Dante himself felt and thought when writing it? In the case of poetic works of a freer kind, I mean those that depend more directly upon inspiration, such as the productions of German Romanticism, we have not even the right to restrict ourselves to what the authors thought about their own creations, if we would interpret the symbolism involved in them. The fact is that in most cases an author does not understand all the meaning of his work, Archaic symbolisms reappear spontaneously even in the works of realist authors who know nothing about such symbols. Moreover, this controversy over the legitimate limits of the hermeneutic appraisals of symbols is quite unprofitable. We have seen that myths decay and symbols become secularized, but that they never disappear, even in the most positivist of civilizations, that of the 19th century. Symbols and myths come from such depths they are part and parcel of the human being. It is impossible that they should not be found again in every and every existential situation of man in the cosmos. Chapter 1. Symbolism of the Center. The Psychology and History of Religions. Many laymen envy the vocation of the historian of religions. What nobler or more rewarding occupation could there be than to frequent the great mystics of all the religions, to live among symbols and mysteries, to read and understand the myths of all the nations. The layman imagines that a historian of religions must be equally at home with the Greeks or the Egyptian mythology, with the authentic teaching of the Buddha, the Taoist mysteries, or the secret rites of initiation in archaic societies. Perhaps laymen are not altogether wrong in thinking that the historian of religions is immersed in vast and genuine problems, engaged in the decipherment of the most impressive symbols and the most complex and lofty myths from the immense mass of material that offers itself to him. 
Yet, in fact, the situation is quite different. A good many historians of religions are so absorbed in their special studies that they know little more about the Greek or Egyptian mythologies, or the Buddhist teaching, or the Taoist or shamanic techniques, than any amateur who has known how to direct his reading. Most of them are really familiar with only one poor little sector of the immense domain of religious history. And unhappily, even this modest sector is, more often than not, but superficially exploited by the decipherment, editing, and translation of texts, historical monographs, or the cataloging of monuments, etc. Confined to an inevitably limited subject, the historian of religions often has a feeling that he has sacrificed the fine spiritual career of his youthful dreams to the dull duty of scientific probity. But the excessive scientific probity of his output has ended by alienating him from the cultured public, Except for quite rare exceptions, the historians of religions are not read outside the restricted circles of their colleagues and disciples. The public no longer reads their books, either because they are too technical or too dull, in short because they awaken no spiritual interest. By force of hearing it repeated, as it was for instance by Sir James Fraser throughout some 20,000 pages, that everything thought, imagined, or desired by man in archaic societies, all his myths and rites, all his gods and religious experiences, are nothing but a monstrous accumulation of madnesses, cruelties, and superstitions now happily abolished by the progress of mankind. By dint of listening almost always to the same thing, the public has at last let itself be convinced, and has ceased to take any interest in the objective study of religions. A portion, at least, of this public tries to satisfy its legitimate curiosity by reading very bad books on the mysteries of the pyramids, the miracles of yoga, on the primordial revelations, or Atlantis. In short, interests itself in the frightful literature of the dilettanti, the neo-spiritualists, or pseudo-occultists. To some degree, it is we, the historians of religions, who are responsible for this. We wanted at all costs to present an objective history of religions but we failed to bear in mind that what we were christening objectivity followed the fashion of thinking in our times. For nearly a century we have been striving to set up the history of religions as an autonomous discipline without success. The history of religions is still, as we all know, confused with anthropology, ethnology, sociology, religious psychology, and even with Orientalism. Desirous to achieve by all means the prestige of a science, the history of religions has passed through all the crises of the modern scientific mind one after another. Historians of religions have been successively, and some of them have not ceased to be, positivists, empiricists, rationalists, or historicists. And what is more, none of the fashions which in succession have dominated this study of ours, not one of the global systems put forward in explanation of the religious phenomenon, has been the work of a historian of religions. They have all derived from hypotheses advanced by eminent linguists, anthropologists, sociologists, or ethnologists, and have been accepted in their turn by everyone, including the historians of religions. The situation that one finds today is as follows. A considerable improvement in information, paid for by excessive specialization and even by sacrificing our own vocation, for the majority of historians of religions have become Orientalists, Classicists, Ethnologists, etc., and a dependence upon the methods elaborated by modern historiography or sociology, as though the historical study of a ritual or a myth were exactly the same thing as that of a country or some primitive people. In short, we have neglected this essential fact that in the title of the history of religions, the accent ought not to be upon the word history, but upon the word religions. For although there are numerous ways of practicing history, from the history of technics to that of human thought, there is only one way of approaching religion, namely to deal with religious facts. Before making the history of anything, one must have a proper understanding of what it is in and of itself. In that connection, I would draw attention to the work of Professor Vanderloo, who has done so much for the phenomenology of religion, and whose many and brilliant publications have aroused the educated public to a renewal of interest in the history of religions in general. In an indirect way, the same interest has been awakened by the discoveries of psychoanalysis and depth psychology, in the first place by the work of Professor Jung, 
Indeed, it was soon recognized that the enormous domain of the history of religions provided an inexhaustible supply of terms of comparison with the behavior of the individual or the collective psyche, as this was studied by psychologists or analysts. As we all know, the use that psychologists have made of such socio-religious documentation has not always obtained the approval of historians of religions. We shall be examining, in a moment, the objections raised against such comparisons, and indeed they have often been too daring. But it may be said at once that if the historians of religions had only approached the objects of their study from a more spiritual standpoint, if they had tried to gain a deeper insight into archaic religious symbolisms, many psychological or psychoanalytic interpretations, which look all too flimsy to a specialist's eye, would never have been suggested. The psychologists have found excellent materials in our books, but very few explanations of any depth. And they have been tempted to fill up these lacunae by taking over the work of the historians of religions, by putting forward general, and often too rash, hypotheses. In few words, the difficulties that have to be overcome today are these. A. On the one hand, having decided to compete for the prestige of an objective scientific historiography, the history of religions is obliged to face the objections that can be raised against historicism as such, and b. On the other hand, it is also obliged to take up the challenge lately presented to it by psychology in general, and particularly by depth psychology, which, now that it is beginning to work directly upon the historico-religious data, is putting forward working hypotheses more promising, more productive, or at any rate more sensational than those that are current among historians of religion. To understand these difficulties better, let us come now to the subject of the present study, the symbolism of the center. A historian of religions has the right to ask, what do you mean by these terms? What symbols are in question? Among which peoples and in what cultures? And he might add, you are not unaware that the epoch of Tyler, of Manhart, and Fraser is over and done with. It is no longer allowable today to speak of myths and rites in general, or of a uniformity in primitive man's reactions to nature. Those generalizations are abstractions, like those of primitive man in general. What is concrete is the religious phenomenon manifested in history and through history. And, from the simple fact that it is manifested in history, it is limited, it is conditioned by history. What meaning, then, for the history of religions could there be in such a formula as, for instance, the ritual approach to immortality? We must first specify what kind of immortality is in question, for we cannot be sure a priori that humanity as a whole has had, spontaneously, the intuition of immortality or even the desire for it. You speak of the symbolism of the center. What right have you, as a historian of religions, to do so? Can one so lightly generalize? One ought rather to begin by asking oneself, in which culture, in following upon what historical events, did the religious notion of the center, or that of immortality, become crystallized? How are these notions integrated and justified in the organic system of such and such a culture? How are they distributed, and among which peoples? Only after having answered all these preliminary questions will one have the right to generalize and systematize, to speak in general about the rights of immortality or symbolisms of the center. If not, one may be contributing to psychology or philosophy or even theology, but not to the history of religions. I think all these objections are justified, and, inasmuch as I am a historian of religions, I intend to take them into account, but I do not regard them as insurmountable. I know well enough that we are dealing with religious phenomena, and that, by the very fact that they are phenomena, that is, manifested or revealed to us, each one is struck, like a metal, by the historical moment in which it was born. There is no purely religious fact outside history and outside time. The noblest religious message, the most universal of mystical experiences, the most universally human behavior, such, for instance, as religious fear or ritual or prayer, is singularized and delimited as soon as it manifests itself. When the Son of God incarnated and became the Christ, he had to speak Aramaic. He could only conduct himself as a Hebrew of his times, and not as a yogi, a Taoist, or a shaman. His religious message, however universal it might be, was conditioned by the past and present history of the Hebrew people. If the Son of God had been born in India, 
His spoken message would have had to conform itself to the structure of the Indian languages and to the historic and prehistoric tradition of that mixture of peoples. In the taking up of this position, one can clearly recognize the speculative progress that has been made from Kant, who may be regarded as a precursor of historicism, down to the latest historicist or existentialist philosophers. Insofar as man is a historic, concrete, authentic being, he is in situation. His authentic existence is realizing itself in history, in time, in his time, which is not that of his father. Neither it is the time of his contemporaries in another continent, or even in another country. That being so, what business have we to be talking about the behavior of man in general? This man in general is no more than an abstraction. He exists only on the strength of a misunderstanding due to the imperfection of language. This is not the place to attempt a philosophical critique of historicism and historicist existentialism. That critique has been made, and by more competent authors. Let us remark for the present that the view of human spiritual life as historically conditioned resumes upon another plane and using an upon another plane and using other dialectical methods, the now somewhat outmoded theories of environmental determinism, geographical, economic, social, and even physiological. Everyone agrees that a spiritual fact, being a human fact, is necessarily conditioned by everything that works together to make a man, from his anatomy and physiology to language itself. In other words, a spiritual fact presupposes the whole human being, that is, the social man, the economic man, and so forth. But all these conditioning factors together do not, of themselves, add up to the life of the spirit. What distinguishes the historian of religions from the historian as such is that he is dealing with facts which, although historical, reveal a behavior that goes far beyond the historical involvements of the human being. Although it is true that man is always found in situation, his situation is not, for all that, always a historical one, in the sense of being conditioned solely by the contemporaneous historical moment. The man in his totality is aware of other situations over and above his historical condition. For example, he knows the state of dreaming, or the waking dream, or of melancholy, or of detachment, or of aesthetic bliss, or of escape, etc. And none of these states is historical, although they are as authentic and as important for human existence as man's historical existence is. Man is also aware of several temporal rhythms, and not only of historical time, his own time, his historical contemporaneity. He has only to listen to good music, to fall in love, or to pray, and he is out of the historical present. He re-enters the eternal present of love and of religion. Even to open a novel or to attend a dramatic performance may be enough to transport a man into another rhythm of time, what one might call condensed time, which is anyhow not historical time. It has been too lightly assumed that the authenticity of an existence depends solely upon the consciousness of its own historicity. Such historic awareness plays a relatively minor part in human consciousness, to say nothing of the zones of the unconscious, which also belong to the makeup of the whole human being. The more a consciousness is awakened, the more it transcends its own historicity. We have only to remind ourselves of the mystics and sages of all times, and primarily those of the Orient. History and Archetypes but let us leave aside the objections that can be raised against historicism and existentialism and come back to our problem, that is, to the dilemmas that confront the historian of religions. As we were saying, he too often forgets that he is concerned with archaic and integral human behavior, and that his business ought not therefore to be reduced to recording the historical manifestations of that behavior. He ought also to be trying to gain deeper insight into its meanings and its articulation. To take one example, it is now known that certain myths and symbols have circulated throughout the world, spread by certain types of culture. This means that those myths and symbols are not, as such, spontaneous discoveries of archaic man, but creations of a well-defined cultural complex, elaborated and carried on in certain human societies. Such creations have been diffused very far from their original home, and have been assimilated by peoples who would not otherwise have known them. 
I believe that, after studying as rigorously as possible the relationships between certain religious complexes and certain forms of culture, and after verifying the stages of diffusion of these complexes, the ethnologist has a right to declare himself satisfied with the results of his researches. But this is not at all the case with the historian of religions. For when once the findings of ethnology have been accepted and integrated, the latter has still further problems to raise. For instance, why was it possible for such a myth or such a symbol to become diffused? What did it reveal? Why are certain details, often very important ones, lost during diffusion whilst others survive? To sum it up, what is it that these myths and symbols answer to, that they should have had such a wide diffusion? These questions cannot be passed over to the psychologists, the sociologists, or the philosophers, for none of these are better prepared to resolve them than is the historian of religions. One has only to take the trouble to study the problem to find out that, whether obtained by diffusion or spontaneously discovered, Myths and rites always disclose a boundary situation of man, not only a historical situation. A boundary situation is one which man discovers in becoming conscious of his place in the universe. It is primarily by throwing light upon these boundary situations that the historian of religions fulfills his task and assists in the researches of depth psychology and even philosophy. This study is possible, moreover it has already begun. By directing attention to the survival of symbols and mythical themes in the psyche of modern man, by showing that the spontaneous rediscovery of the archetypes of archaic symbolism is a common occurrence in all human beings, irrespective of race and historical surroundings, depth psychology has freed the historian of religions from his last hesitations. We will give a few examples in a moment of this spontaneous rediscovery of archaic symbolism, and we shall see what these can teach a historian of religions. But already one can guess what perspectives would open up before the history of religions, if only it knew how to profit by all its discoveries together with those of ethnology, sociology, and depth psychology. By envisaging the study of man not only in as much as he is a historic being, but also as a living symbol, the history of religions could become, if we may be pardoned the word, a meta-psychoanalysis, for this would lead to an awakening and a renewal of consciousness of the archaic symbols and archetypes, whether still living or now fossilized in the religious traditions of all mankind. We have dared to use the term meta-psychoanalysis because what is in question here is a more spiritual technique, applicable mainly to elucidating the theoretical content of the symbols and archetypes, giving transparency and coherence to what is elusive, cryptic, or fragmentary. One could equally well call this a new maiutics. Just as Socrates, according to the Theotetus, acted on the mind obstetrically, bringing to birth thoughts it did not know it contained, so the history of religions could bring forth a new man, more authentic and more complete. For, through the study of the religious traditions, modern man would not only rediscover a kind of archaic behavior, he would also become conscious of the spiritual riches applied in such behavior. This maiutics, effected with the aid of religious symbolism, would also help to rescue modern man from his cultural provincialism, and above all, from his historical and existentialist relativism. For, as we shall see, man is opposing himself to history even when he sets out to make history, and even when he pretends to be nothing but history. And insofar as man surpasses his historic moment and gives free course to his desire to relive the archetypes, he realizes himself as a whole and universal being. Insofar as he opposes himself to history, modern man rediscovers the archetypal positions. Even his sleep, even his orgiastic tendencies are charged with spiritual significance. By the simple fact that, at the heart of his being, he rediscovers the cosmic rhythms, the alterations of day and night, for instance, or of winter and summer, he comes to a more complete knowledge of his own destiny and significance. Still, with the aid of the history of religions, man might rediscover the symbolism of his body, which is an anthropocosmos. What the various techniques of the imagination, and especially the poetic techniques, have realized in this direction is almost nothing besides what the history of religions might promise. All these things still exist even in modern man. 
It is only necessary to reactivate them and bring them to the level of consciousness. By regaining awareness of his own anthropocosmic symbolism, which is only one variety of the archaic symbolism, modern man will obtain a new existential dimension totally unknown to present-day existentialism and historicism. This is an authentic and major mode of being, which defends man from nihilism and historical relativism without thereby taking him out of history. For history itself will one day be able to find its true meaning, that of the epiphany of a glorious and absolute human condition. We have only to recall the value attached to historical existence by Judeo-Christianity to realize how, and in what sense, history might become glorious and even absolute. Obviously, one could never pretend that rational study of the history of religions should or could be substituted for religious experience itself, still less for the experience of faith. But even for the Christian consciousness, a maeutics affected by means of the archaic symbolism will bear its fruit. Christianity is the inheritor of a very ancient and very complex religious tradition, whose structures have survived in the midst of the church, even though the spiritual values and theological orientation have changed. And in any case, nothing whatever throughout the cosmos that is a manifestation of glory, to speak in Christian terms, can be a matter of indifference to a believer. Finally, the study of religions will shed light upon one fact that until now has been insufficiently noted, namely that there is a logic of the symbol. Certain groups of symbols at least prove to be coherent, logically connected with one another. In a word, they can be systematically formulated, translated into rational terms. This internal logic of symbols raises a problem with far-reaching consequences. Are certain zones of the individual or collective consciousness dominated by the logos, or are we concerned here with manifestations of a trans-conscious? That problem cannot be resolved by depth psychology alone for the symbolisms which decipher the latter are, for the most part, made up of scattered fragments and of the manifestations of a psyche in crisis, if not in a state of pathological regression. To grasp the authentic structures and functions of symbols, one must turn to the inexhaustible indices of the history of religions. And yet even here, one must know how to choose, for our documents are in many cases decadent in form, aberrant, or frankly, second-rate. If we want to arrive at an adequate understanding of archaic religious symbolism, we are obliged to make a selection, just as, in order to gain some idea of a foreign literature, we must not take at hazard the first ten or the first hundred books to be found in the nearest public library. It is to be hoped that one day the historians of religion will make a hierarchic assessment of their documents according to the value and the condition of each, as do their colleagues, the historians of literature. But here again, we are only at the beginning of things. <clears throat> the Image of the World In archaic and traditional societies, the surrounding world is conceived as a microcosm. At the limits of this closed world begins the domain of the unknown, of the formless. On this side, there is ordered, because inhabited and organized, space. On the other, outside this familiar space, there is the unknown and dangerous region of the demons, the ghosts, the dead, and the foreigners. In a word, chaos or death or night. This image of an inhabited microcosm, surrounded by desert regions regarded as a chaos or a kingdom of the dead, has survived even in highly evolved civilizations such as those of China, Mesopotamia, and Egypt. Indeed, a good many texts liken the enemies who are attacking national territory to ghosts, demons, or the powers of chaos. Thus the adversaries of the pharaoh were looked upon as sons of ruin, wolves, dogs, etc. The pharaoh was likened to the god Ra, victor of the dragon Apophis, whilst these enemies were identified with that same mythical dragon. Because they attack and endanger the equilibrium in the very life of the city, or of any other inhabited and organized territory, enemies are assimilated into demonic powers, trying to reincorporate the microcosm into the state of chaos, that is, to suppress it. The destruction of an established order, the abolition of an archetypal image, was equivalent to a regression into chaos, into the pre-formal, undifferentiated state that preceded the cosmogony. Let us note that the same images are still invoked in our own days, when people want to formulate the dangers that menace a certain type of civilization, 
There is much talk of chaos, of disorder, of the dark ages into which our world is subsiding. All these expressions, it is felt, signify the abolition of an order, of a cosmos, of a structure, and the re-immersion in a state that is fluid, amorphous, in the end, chaotic. The conception of the enemy as a demonic being, a veritable incarnation of the powers of evil, has also survived until our days. The psychoanalysis of these mythic images that still animate the modern world will perhaps show us the extent to which we project our own destructive desires upon the enemy. But that is a problem beyond our competence. What we wish to bring to light is that, for the archaic world in general, the enemies threatening the microcosm were dangerous, not in their capacity as human beings, but because they were incarnating the hostile and destructive powers. It is very probable that the defenses of inhabited areas and cities began by being magical defenses, for these defenses, ditches, labyrinths, ramparts, etc., were set up to prevent the incursions of evil spirits rather than attacks from human beings. Even fairly late in history, in the Middle Ages, for instance, the walls of cities were ritually consecrated as a defense against the devil, sickness, and death. Moreover, the archaic symbolism finds no difficulty in assimilating the human enemy to the devil or to death. After all, the result of their attacks, whether demonic or military, is always the same. Ruin, disintegration, and death. Every microcosm, every inhabited region, has what may be called a center, that is to say, a place that is sacred above all. It is there, in that center, that the sacred manifests itself in its totality, either in the form of elementary hierophanies, as it does among the primitives, in the totemic centers, for example, the caves where the tetrungas are buried, or else in the more evolved form of the direct epiphanies of the gods, as in the traditional civilizations. But we must not envisage the symbolism of the center with the geometrical implications that it has to a Western scientific mind. For each one of these microcosms, there may be several centers. As we shall see before long, all the Oriental civilizations, Mesopotamia, India, China, etc., recognized an unlimited number of centers. Moreover, each one of these centers was considered and even literally called the center of the world. The place in question being a sacred space, consecrated by a hierophany or ritually constructed, and not a profane, homogeneous geometrical space, the plurality of centers of the world within a single inhabited region presented no difficulty. What we have here is a sacred, mythic geography, the only kind effectually real, as opposed to profane geography, the latter being objective and, as it were, abstract and non-essential, the theoretical construction of a space and a world that we do not live in, and therefore do not know. In mythical geography, sacred space is the essentially real space, for, as it has been lately shown, in the archaic world, the myth alone is real. It tells of manifestations of the only indubitable reality, the sacred. It is in such space that one has direct contact with the sacred, whether this be materialized in certain objects or manifested in the hero-cosmic symbols, the pillar of the world, the cosmic tree, etc. In cultures that have the conception of three cosmic regions, those of heaven, earth, and hell, the center constitutes the point of intersection of those regions. It is here that the breakthrough onto another plane is possible, and, at the same time, communication between the three regions. We have reason to believe that this image of three cosmic levels is quite archaic. We meet with it, for instance, among the Samang pygmies of the Malay Peninsula. At the center of their world there stands an enormous rock, Batu Ribbon, and beneath it is Hell. From the Batu Ribbon a tree trunk formerly reached up towards the sky. Hell, the center of the earth, and the door of heaven are all to be found, then, upon the same axis and it is along this axis that the passage from one cosmic region to another is effected. We might hesitate to believe in the authenticity of this cosmological theory among the Semang pygmies, were we not bound to admit that the same theory already existed in outline in prehistoric times. The Semang say that the trunk of a tree formerly connected the summit of the cosmic mountain, the center of the world, with heaven. 
This is an allusion to a mythic theme of extremely wide diffusion. Formerly, communication with heaven and relations with the divinity were easy and natural, until, in consequence of a ritual fault, these communications were broken off, and the gods withdrew still to higher heavens. Only medicine men, shamans, priests, and heroes, or the sovereign rulers were now able to re-establish communication with heaven, and that only in a temporary way and for their own use. The myth of a primordial paradise, lost on account of some fault or other, is of extreme importance. But although in some ways it touches upon our subject, we cannot discuss this now. Symbolism of the Center Let us now return to the image of the three cosmic regions connected in a center along one axis. It is chiefly in the early Oriental civilizations that we meet with this archetypal image. The name of the sanctuaries of Nippur, Larsa, and Lepara was Dur-Anki, link between heaven and earth. Babylon had a whole list of names, among others, House of the Basis of Heaven and Earth, and Link Between Heaven and Earth. But there was also in Babylon the link between the earth and the lower regions, for the town had been built upon Bap Apsu, the gate of Apsu, Apsu meaning the waters of chaos before the creation. We find the same tradition among the Hebrews. The rock of Jerusalem went deep down into the subterranean waters. It is said in the Mishnah that the temple stood just over the Tehom. And just as in Babylon they had the gate of Apsu, so in Jerusalem the rock of the temple covered the mouth of the Tehom. We encounter similar traditions in the Indo-European world. Among the Romans, for example, the Mundus constitutes the meeting point between the lower regions and the terrestrial world. The Italic temple was the zone of intersection between the higher, divine world, the terrestrial world, and the subterranean, infernal world. Every oriental city was standing, in effect, at the center of the world. Babylon was Bib Ilani, a gate of the gods, for it was there that the gods came down to earth. The capital of the ideal Chinese sovereign was situated near to the miraculous tree-shaped wood, at the intersection of the three cosmic zones, heaven, earth, and hell. Examples could be multiplied without end. These cities, temples, or palaces, regarded as centers of the world, are all only replicas, repeating ab libitum, the same archaic image, the cosmic mountain, the world tree, or the central pillar which sustains the plains of the cosmos. This symbol of a mountain, a tree, or a column situated at the center of the world is extremely widely distributed. We may recall the Mount Miru of Indian tradition, the Hara Berezaite of the Iranians, the Norse Himingbyor, the Mount of the Lands, in the Mesopotamian tradition, Mount Tabor in Palestine, which may signify Tabur, that is, navel or Amphalos, Mount Gerizim, again in Palestine, which is expressly named the navel of the earth, and Golgotha, which, for Christians, represented the center of the world, etc. Because the territory, the city, the temple, or the royal palace thus stood at the center of the world, that is, on the summit of the cosmic mountain, each was regarded as the highest place in the world, the only one which had not been submerged at the deluge. The land of Israel was not submerged by the deluge, says a rabbinical text, and according to Islamic tradition, the highest elevated place on earth is the Kaaba, because the pole star proves that it lies over against the center of heaven. The names of sacred Babylonian towers and temples show that they were assimilated to the cosmic mountain, that is, to the center of the world, Mount of the House, House of the Mountain of all the lands, Mount of Storms, Bond between heaven and earth, etc. The Zikorat was, properly speaking, a cosmic mountain, that is, a symbolic image of the cosmos. Its seven stages represented the seven planetary spheres. By ascending them, the priests attained to the summit of the universe. This same symbolism informs the colossal construction of the Temple of Barabudur, which is shaped like an artificial mountain. To ascend it is equivalent to an ecstatic journey to the center of the world. Upon reaching the highest terrace, the pilgrim experiences the breakthrough into another state. He transcends profane space and enters into a pure region. Here we are in the presence of a rite of the center. 
The summit of the cosmic mountain is not only the highest point on the earth, it is the navel of the earth, the point at which creation began. The Holy One created the world like an embryo, affirms a rabbinical text. As an embryo proceeds from the navel outward, so God began the creation of the world from its navel onward, and from thence it spread in different directions. The world was created beginning at Zion, says another text. The same symbolism occurs in ancient India, in the Rig Veda, where the universe is conceived as expanding outward from a central point. The creation of man, a replica of the cosmogony, took place similarly from a central point, in the center of the world. According to the Mesopotamian tradition, man was fashioned at the navel of the earth, where there is also Dur-an-ki, the link between heaven and earth. Ormazd created the primordial man Gajomard at the center of the world. The paradise in which Adam was created out of clay is, of course, situated at the center of the cosmos. Paradise was the navel of the earth, and according to a Syrian tradition, was established upon a mountain higher than all others. According to the Syrian book, The Cavern of Treasures, Adam was created at the center of the earth, on the very same spot where, later on, the cross of Jesus was to be erected. The same traditions have been preserved by Judaism. The Judaic Apocalypse and the Midrash specify that Adam was fashioned in Jerusalem. And Adam, having been buried at the same spot where he was created, that is, at the center of the world, upon Golgotha, the blood of the Lord will redeem him also. The most widely distributed variant of the symbolism of the center is the cosmic tree, situated in the middle of the universe, and upholding the three worlds as upon one axis. Vedic India, ancient China, and the Germanic mythology, as well as the primitive religions, all held different versions of this cosmic tree, whose roots plunged down into hell, and whose branches reached to heaven. In the Central and North Asiatic mythologies, its seven or nine branches symbolize the seven or nine celestial planes, that is, the seven planetary heavens. We have not room here to enlarge upon the complex symbolism of this tree of the world. What concerns us now is the part it plays in the rites of the center. It may be said in general that the majority of the sacred and ritual trees that we meet with in the history of religions are only replicas, imperfect copies of this exemplary archetype, the cosmic tree. Thus all these sacred trees are thought of as situated in the center of the world, and all the ritual trees or posts which are consecrated before or during any religious ceremony are, as it were, magically projected into the center of the world. Let us content ourselves with a few examples. In Vedic India, the sacrificial stake, Yupa, is made of a tree which is similar to the universal tree. While it is being felled, the priest of the sacrifice addresses these words to it, With thy summit do not rend the heavens, with thy trunk wound not the atmosphere. It is easy to see that what we have here is the cosmic tree itself. From the wood of this tree the sacrificial stake is fashioned, and this becomes a sort of cosmic pillar. Lift thyself up, O Lord of the forest, unto the summit of the earth, is the invocation of the Rig Veda. With thy summit thou dost hold up the heavens, with thy branches thou fillest the air, with thy foot thou steadiest the earth, proclaims the Satapatha Brahmana. The installation and consecration of the sacrificial stake constitute a rite of the center. Assimilated to the cosmic tree, the stake becomes in its turn the axis connecting the three cosmic regions. Communication between heaven and earth becomes possible by means of this pillar. He who makes the sacrifice does, indeed, go up to heaven, alone or with his wife, upon this post now ritually transformed into the world axis itself. While setting up the ladder, he says to his wife, Come, let us go up to heaven. She answers, Let us go up, and they begin to mount the ladder. At the top, while touching the head of the post, the sacrificer cries out, We have reached heaven. Or, while climbing up the steps of the stake, he stretches out his arms, as a bird spreads its wings, and on reaching the top cries out, I have attained to heaven, to the gods, I have become immortal. In truth, continues the scripture, the sacrificer makes himself a ladder and a bridge to, the reach, to reach the celestial world. 
The bridge or ladder between heaven and earth were possible because they were set up in a center of the world, like the ladder seen in a dream by Jacob, which reached from earth to the heavens. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending it. The Indian rite also alludes to the immortality that is attained in consequence of the ascent into heaven. As we shall see presently, a number of other ritual approaches to a center are equivalent to a conquest of immortality. The assimilation of the ritual tree to the cosmic tree is still more apparent in Central and North Asiatic shamanism. The climbing of such a tree by the Tatar shaman symbolizes his ascension to heaven. In fact, seven or nine notches are cut in the tree and the shaman, while he is climbing up them, makes the pertinent declaration that he is going up to heaven. He describes to the onlookers all that he sees at each of the celestial levels which he passes through. At the sixth heaven he worships the moon, at the seventh the sun, finally at the ninth he prostrates himself before Bai Ulgan, the supreme being, and offers him the soul of the horse that has been sacrificed. The shamanic tree is only a replica of the tree of the world, which rises in the middle of the universe, and at whose summit is the supreme god, or the solarized god. The seven or nine notches on the shamanic tree symbolize the seven or nine branches of the cosmic tree, that is, the seven or nine heavens. The shaman feels, moreover, that he is united with this tree of the world through other mystical relationships. In his initiatory dreams, the future shaman is believed to approach the cosmic tree and to receive, from the hand of God himself, three branches of it, which are to serve as frames for his drums. We know the indispensable part that is played by the drum during the shamanic ceremonies. It is above all by the aid of their drums that shamans attain to the ecstatic state. And when we think that the drum is made of the very wood of the world tree, we can understand the symbolism and the religious value of the sounds of the shamanic drum, and why when he beats it, the shaman feels himself transported in ecstasy near to the tree of the world. Here we have a mystical journey to the center, and thence into the highest heaven. Thus, either by climbing up the seven or nine notches of the ceremonial birch tree, or simply drumming, the shaman sets out on his journey to heaven. But he can only obtain that rupture of the cosmic planes which makes his ascension possible, or enables him to fly ecstatically through the heavens, because he is thought to be already at the very center of the world. For we have seen it is only in such a center that communication between earth, heaven, and hell is possible. Symbolism of Ascension It is highly probable, at least in the case of the Central Asiatic and Siberian religions, that this symbolism of the center was influenced by some Indo-Iranian and, in the last analysis, Mesopotamian cosmological systems. The importance of the number seven seems, among other things, to prove this but it is important to distinguish between the borrowing of a cosmological theory elaborated around the symbol of the center, such as, for example, the conception of the seven celestial spheres, and the symbolism of the center in itself. We have already seen that this symbolism is extremely archaic, that it is known to the pygmies of the Malay Peninsula, and even if we might suspect a remote Indian influence among these Semang pygmies, we should still have to explain the symbolism of the center that is found upon the prehistoric monuments, cosmic mountains, the four rivers, the tree, the spiral, etc. Furthermore, it has been possible to show that the symbolism of a cosmic axis was already known in the archaic cultures, especially among the Arctic and North American populations. The center post of the cabin they live in is assimilated to the cosmic axis, and it is at the foot of this post that one deposits the offerings intended for the heavenly divinities, for it is only along this axis that offerings can mount up into heaven. When the form of the dwelling is changed, and the hut is replaced by the yurt, as, for example, among the nomadic stock breeders of Central Asia, the mythico ritual function of the central pillar is performed through the opening left in the roof to let out the smoke. On sacrificial occasions, they bring a tree into the yurt so that the top of it projects through this opening. This sacrificial tree, with its seven branches, symbolizes the seven celestial spheres. Thus, on the one hand, the house is made to symbolize the universe, and on the other, is supposed to be situated in the center of the world, 
the smoke hole opening towards the pole star. We shall return presently to this symbolic assimilation of the dwelling place to the center of the world, for it expresses one of the most instructive customs of archaic religious man. For the moment, let us look at the ritual of ascension that takes place in a center. We saw that the Tatar or Siberian shaman climbs a tree, and that the Vedic sacrificer mounts a ladder. The two rites are directed to the same end, the ascension into heaven. A good many of the myths speak of a tree, of a creeper, a cord, or a thread of spider web, or a ladder which connects earth with heaven, and by means of which certain privileged beings do, in effect, mount up to heaven. These myths have, of course, their ritual correlatives, as, for instance, the shamanic tree or the post in the Vedic sacrifice. The ceremonial staircase plays an equally important part, of which we will now give a few examples. Polyanus tells us of Kosingas, the priest-king of certain peoples of Thrace, who threatened to desert his subjects by going up a wooden ladder to the goddess Hera, which proves that such a ritual ladder existed and was believed to be a means whereby the priest-king could ascend to heaven. The ascension to heaven by ritually climbing up a ladder was probably part of an Orphic initiation. In any case, we might find it again in the Mithraic initiation. In the mysteries of Mithra, the ceremonial ladder, Climax, had seven rungs, each being made of a different metal. According to Chelsus, the first rung was made of lead, corresponding to the heaven of the planet Saturn, the second of tin, Venus, the third of bronze, Jupiter, the fourth of iron, Mercury, the fifth of monetary alloy, Mars, the sixth of silver, the moon, and the seventh of gold, the sun. The eighth ring, Chelsus tells us, represented the sphere of the fixed stars. By going up this ceremonial ladder, the initiate was supposed to pass through the seven heavens, thus uplifting himself even to the Empyrean, just as one attained to the ultimate heaven by ascending the seven stages of the Babylonian Sycorot, or as one traveled through the different cosmic regions by scaling the terraces of the temple of Barabudur, which in itself, as we saw, constituted a cosmic mountain and an imago mundi. We can easily understand that the stairway in the Mithraic initiation was an axis of the world and was situated at the center of the universe. Otherwise, the rupture of the planes would not have been possible. Initiation means, as we know, the symbolic death and resurrection of the neophyte, or in other contexts, the descent into hell, followed by ascension into heaven. Death whether initiatory or not, is the supreme case of a rupture of the planes. That is why it is symbolized by a climbing of steps, and why funerary rites often make use of ladders or stairways. The soul of the deceased ascends the pathways up a mountain, or climbs a tree, or a creeper, right up into the heavens. We meet with something of this conception all over the world, from ancient Egypt to Australia. In Assyrian, the common expression for the verb to die is to clutch the mountain. Similarly, in Egyptian, to clutch is a euphemism for to die. In the Indian mythological tradition, Yama, the first man to die, climbed up the mountain and over the high passes in order to show the path to many, as it is said in the Rig Veda. The road of the dead in popular Ural Altaic beliefs leads up to the mountain, Bolat, the Kara Kirga's hero, and also Kassar, legendary king of the Mongols, enter into the world of the beyond by way of an initiatory ordeal through a cave at the summit of the mountains. The descent of the shaman into hell is also effected by way of a cavern. The Egyptians have preserved in their funerary texts the expression, a step, to indicate that the ladder at the disposal of Ra is a real ladder linking earth to heaven. The ladder is set up that I may see the gods, says the Book of the Dead, and again, the gods make him a ladder so that, by making use of it, he may go up to heaven. In many tombs of the periods of the Archaic and the Middle Dynasties, amulets have been found engraved with a ladder or a staircase. The custom of the funerary ladder has, moreover, survived until our days. Several primitive Asian peoples, as, for instance, the Lolos, the Karens, and others set up ritual ladders upon tombs to enable the deceased to ascend to heaven. 
As we have just seen, the latter can carry an extremely rich symbolism without ceasing to be perfectly coherent. It gives plastic expression to the break through the planes necessitated by the passage from one mode of being to another, by placing us at the cosmological point where communication between heaven, earth, and hell becomes possible. That is why the stairway and the ladder play so considerable a part in the rites and the myths of initiation, as well as in funerary rituals, not to mention the rites of royal or sacerdotal enthronement, or those of marriage. But we also know that the symbolism of climbing up and of stairs recurs often enough in psychoanalytic literature, an indication that it belongs to the archaic content of the human psyche and is not a historical creation, not an innovation dating from a certain historical moment, say from ancient Egypt or Vedic India, etc. I will content myself with a single example of a spontaneous rediscovery of this primordial symbolism. Julian Green notes in his journal for the 4th of April, 1933, that, in all my books, the idea of fear, or of any other fairly strong emotion, seems linked in some inexplicable manner to a staircase. I realized this yesterday, whilst I passed in review all the novels that I have written. Here follow the references. I wonder how I can have so often repeated this effect without noting it. As a child, I used to dream I was being chased on a staircase. My mother had the same fears in her younger days. Perhaps something of them has remained with me. We now know why the idea of fear for Julian Green was associated with the image of a staircase, and while all the dramatic events he described in his works, love, death, or crime, happened upon a staircase. The act of climbing or ascending symbolizes the way towards the absolute reality, and to the profane consciousness, the approach towards that reality arouses an ambivalent feeling of fear and of joy, of attraction and repulsion, etc. The ideas of sanctification, of death, love, and deliverance are all involved in the symbolism of stairs. Indeed, each of these modes of being represents a cessation of the profane human condition, that is, a breaking of the ontological plane. Through love and death, sanctity and metaphysical knowledge, man passes, as it is said in the Upanishad, from the unreal to the reality. But it must not be forgotten that the staircase symbolizes these things because it is thought to be set up in a center, because it makes communication possible between the different levels of being, and finally, because it is a concrete formula for the mythical ladder, for the creeper or the spider web, the cosmic tree or the pillar of the universe that connects the three cosmic zones. Construction of a center. We have seen that it was not only temples that were thought to be situated at the center of the world, but that every holy place, every place that bore witness to an incursion of the sacred into profane space, was also regarded as a center. These sacred spaces could also be constructed, but their construction was, in its way, a cosmogony, a creation of the world, which is only natural since, as we have seen, the world was created in the beginning from an embryo, from a center. Thus, for instance, the construction of the Vedic fire altar reproduced the creation of the world, and the altar itself was a microcosm, in Imago Mundi. The water in which one mixes the clay is, as the Brahmana tells us, the primordial water, the clay that serves as a base for the altar is the earth. Its lateral walls represent the atmosphere, etc. Perhaps it should be added that this construction also implies a construction of cosmic time, but we have not room to go into that problem here. It is unnecessary, then, to insist that the history of religions records a considerable number of ritual constructions of a center. Let us, however, note one thing which is of importance in our view. To the degree that the ancient holy places, temples, or altars lose their religious efficacy, people discover and apply other geomantic, architectural, or iconographic formulas which, in the end, sometimes astonishingly enough, represent the same symbolism of the center. To give a single example, the construction of a mandala. The term itself means a circle. The translations from the Tibetan sometimes render it by center, and sometimes by that which surrounds. In fact, a mandala represents a whole series of circles, concentric or otherwise, inscribed within a square. And in this diagram, drawn on the ground by means of colored threads or colored rice powder, 
the various divinities of the Tantric Pantheon are arranged in order. The mandala thus represents an imago mundi, and at the same time a symbolic pantheon. The initiation of the neophyte consists, among other things, in his entering into the different zones and gaining access to the different levels of the mandala. This rite of penetration may be regarded as equivalent to the well-known rite of walking round a temple, or to the progressive elevation, terrace by terrace, up to the pure lands at the highest levels of the temple. On the other hand, the placing of the neophytes in a mandala may be likened to the initiation by entry into a labyrinth. Certain mandalas have, moreover, a clearly labyrinthine character. The function of the mandala may be considered at least twofold, as is that of the labyrinth. On the one hand, penetration into a mandala drawn on the ground is equivalent to an initiation ritual, and on the other hand, the mandala protects the neophyte against every harmful force from without, and at the same time helps him to concentrate, to find his own center. But every Indian temple seen from above is a mandala. Any Indian temple is, like a mandala, a microcosm, and at the same time a pantheon. Why then need one construct a mandala? Why did they want a new center of the world? Simply because, for certain devotees, who felt in need of more authentic and a deeper religious experience, the traditional ritual had become fossilized. The construction of a fire altar or the ascent of the terraces of a temple no longer enabled them to rediscover their center. Unlike archaic man or the man of Vedic times, the tantric devotee had need of a personal experience to reactivate certain primordial symbols in his consciousness. That is why, moreover, some tantric schools rejected the external mandala and had recourse to interiorized mandalas. This could be of two kinds. First, a purely mental construction, which acted as a support for meditation, or alternatively, an identification of the mandala in his own body. In the former case, the yogi places himself mentally within the mandala and thereby performs an act of concentration and, at the same time, of defense, against distraction and temptation. The mandala concentrates. It preserves one from dispersion, from distraction. The discovery of the mandala in his own body indicates a desire to identify his mystical body with a microcosm. A more detailed analysis of this penetration by means of yoga techniques into what might be called the mystical body would take us too far. Suffice it to say that the reactivization of the chakras, those wheels or circles, which are regarded as so many points of intersection of the cosmic life and the mental life, is homologous with the initiatory penetration into a mandala. The awakening of the kundalini is equivalent to the breaking of the ontological plane, that is, to the plenary realization of the symbolism of the center. As we have seen, the mandala can be used in support, either at the same time or successively, of a concrete ritual or an act of spiritual concentration, or again, of a technique of mystical physiology. This multivalency, this applicability to multiple, although closely comparable planes, is a characteristic of the symbolism of the center in general. This is easily understandable, since every human being tends, even unconsciously, towards the center, and towards his own center, where he can find integral reality, sacredness. This desire so deeply rooted in man to find himself at the very heart of the real, at the center of the world, the place of communication with heaven, explains the ubiquitous use of centers of the world. We have seen above how the habitation of man was assimilated to the universe, the hearth or the smoke hole being homologized with the center of the world, so that all houses, like all temples, palaces, and cities, are situated at one and the same point, the center of the universe. But is there not a certain contradiction here? A whole array of myths, symbols, and rituals emphasizes with one accord the difficulty of obtaining entry into a center. While on the other hand, another series of myths and rites lays it down that this center is accessible, for example, pilgrimage to the holy places is difficult, but any visit whatever to a church is a pilgrimage. The cosmic tree is, on the one hand, inaccessible, but on the other hand, it may be found in any yurt. The way which leads to the center is sown with obstacles, and yet every city, every temple, every dwelling place is already at the center of the universe. 
The sufferings and the trials undergone by Ulysses are fabulous. Nevertheless, any return to hearth and home, whatever, is equivalent to Ulysses' return to Ithaca. All this seems to show that man can live only in a sacred space, in the center. We observe that one group of traditions attests the desire of man to find himself at the center without any effort, whilst another group insists upon the difficulty and consequently upon the merit of being able to enter into it. We are not here concerned to trace the history of either of these traditions. The fact that the first mentioned, the easy way, which allows of the construction of a center even in man's own house, is found nearly everywhere, invites us to regard it as the more significant. It calls attention to something in the human condition that we may call the nostalgia for paradise. By this we mean the desire to find oneself always and without effort in the center of the world. At the heart of reality, and by a shortcut, and in a natural manner to transcend the human condition, and to recover the divine condition. As a Christian would say, the condition before the fall. We should not like to terminate this study without having recalled one European myth which, though only indirectly concerned with the symbolism and rites of the center, combines and integrates them in a still vaster symbolism. We refer to the episode in the legend of Parsifal and the Fisher King, concerning the mysterious malady that paralyzed the old king who held the secret of the grail. It was not he alone who suffered. Everything around him was falling into ruins, crumbling away. The palace, the towers, and the gardens. Animals no longer bred. Trees bore no more fruit. The springs were drying up. Many doctors had tried to cure the Fisher King, all without the least success. The knights were arriving there day and night, each of them asking first of all for news of the king's health. But one knight, poor, unknown, and even slightly ridiculous, took the liberty of disregarding ceremony and politeness. His name was Parsifal. Paying no attention to courtly custom, he made straight for the king and, addressing him without any preamble, asked, Where is the grail? In that very instant, everything is transformed. The king rises from his bed of suffering. The rivers and fountains flow once more. Vegetation grows again, and the castle is miraculously restored. Those few words of Parsifal had been enough to regenerate the whole of nature. But those few words propound the central question, the one question that can arouse not only the Fisher King, but the whole cosmos. Where is the supreme reality, the sacred, the center of life, and the source of immortality? Where is the Holy Grail? No one had thought until then of asking that central question, and the world was perishing because of that metaphysical and religious indifference, because of lack of imagination and absence of desire for reality. That brief episode of a great European myth reveals to us at least one neglected aspect of the symbolism of the center, that there is not only an intimate interconnection between the universal life and the salvation of man, but that it is enough only to raise the question of salvation, to pose the central problem, that is, THE problem, for the life of the cosmos to be forever renewed. For, as this mythological fragment seems to show, death is often only the result of our indifference to immortality.